Okay, you know, one of the hot topics, uh, it's it's been that way for quite some time. And, of course, everybody had the calendar. Uh, it's January the 1st. Here we go with the bail reform law coming into place, uh, coming to uh, fruition. And it's been uh, a very, very uh, big-time topic of conversation. A lot of people are somewhat taken by this new law, angry by this new law. And here to talk about it this morning is State Senator John Brooks. He represents uh, District Number 8. Uh, always great to, to have him back. A very welcomed addition this morning. We say a very happy New Year uh, to Senator Brooks and welcome him aboard. Sir, how are you? Okay, Jay, and happy New Year to you. Uh, great to have you, Senator. So, uh, this listen, it's it's been that way. It's been a hot topic, you know. Uh, you're one of the leading backers of this bill. Uh, did you have any anticipation... Uh, as far as uh, being complete success uh, when drawn up and signed into law? Did you have any reservations at the time? Did you know you were going to get any type of backlash of this particular magnitude? Uh, let's go back to the origin of it all. What about the uh, the time as far as the embryonic stages of this, Senator? The, the bill really was drafted by uh, a number of the legislators uh, on uh, the majority side. There, there were a number of us that uh, had some concerns uh, as we went through the process in terms of the the broadness, if you will, of uh, the release of, of individuals and individuals that wouldn't be subject to uh, bail. Uh, after the, the, bu- the bill itself was part of the budget, it wasn't passed as an individual uh, piece of legislation, but rather part of the budget w- when it went through. We knew, many of us knew, uh, after the passage of the bill, there was going to be, uh, for lack of a better word, tweaking that had to be done. Uh, We have been talking to members of law enforcement, uh, members of the legal community, uh, correction officers, police commissioners, for an extended period of time on uh, tweaks that should be made, and we're continuing those discussions. For myself, we need to uh, expand and, and give some uh, discretion to the judges on these cases when when they come before them as to what should be done. But as I say, there's ongoing discussions being held right now. Senator John Brooks with us, and I know there are going to be discussions today with the majority leader, Andrew Stewart-Cousins. You'll have uh, some advocates up there as far as how to possibly change the DAs. I know both here on the island will be meeting with her. Uh, you're going to have law enforcement. Um, you know, what, what about other than the judge's discretion? Because that's a big one. Because, you know, we 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 had on Senator Brooks, we had Senator Kaplan on Friday, Senator Gorin on yesterday. I just want to get your take. We know the judge's discretion has pretty much been slashed here. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said it now for a long time. It's about public safety. Uh, no matter no matter what the charge is or whatever, in deciding whether a suspect needs to be jailed pending trial, uh, it, it, it's it's just that way right now. And there's a reason why 47 states give judges that authority. I include New Jersey, which, which eliminated, by the way, most of the cash bill. But besides judges' discretion in your mind, uh, what else do you think needs to be changed here? And uh, rapidly, I might add. Well, I, th- I think, number one, we have to uh, – we have what – what you could call a description of what's considered to be violent crimes, I think that has to be expanded. Uh, certainly, if we have an individual walking, let's say, on a uh, on a school grounds with a loaded weapon, that should be considered a violent act. One of the things we're seeing right now with individuals that have been released is they're going back and committing other crimes and then being released again. Uh, I think we have to examine and expand the number of cases that are considered violent to, to hold those back. But I really do believe that judges' description, uh, the discretion is important in this situation. You know, we have judges for a reason, and that and that's to interpret the law. You look at the Supreme Court, for example, we have nine judges because sometimes people have different view of what the law says. People will have different view on who is or isn't potentially violent criminal or somebody who provides a, a risk to the community. When you write a bill, you, you don't have the ability to clearly describe who falls in what category. I think the judges having that description, uh, discre- excuse me, uh, discretion is in a position where they can 
evaluate many factors. One of the one of the concerns that I have too, and I've gotten calls from a number of people on this, where they have a situation where someone has a mental health problem. These people are being released back to the streets. We need to get them some help. I re- received a call from one parent whose child has some problems. The child is constantly threatening both uh, that individual and his wife. He's picked up and then released right away. We've got to realize we have to protect our community. And the judges can look at these cases when they're before them and make what I think is the better decision as to how that individual can be treated uh, treated, uh, rather than just being released back into the the street, so to speak. To State Senator John Brooks of the 8th District talking about the uh, cash bail reform law in place. Changes certainly needed. Senator Brooks has uh, been trying to certainly put forth uh, those changes. Now, you know, I've stated all along, uh, Senator Brooks, you know, besides the judge's situation, I have a big problem with disclosure and discovery here. You know, I think that uh, that what needs to be fixed here is the reversal of the presumption of rapid disclosure of victim and witness information. Uh, I think uh, their names and identifying information should be redacted uh, until... Um, Uh, defense attorneys at least make the case for why they need to know at the start of the process rather than the weeks leading up to a trial. I think uh, that's number two in that whole deal, besides judges. Uh, And the third one, I think, is discovery. You know, uh, they need people or the lawmakers in general need to kind of slash uh, the rest of the new discovery requirements, at least to a level You know, that crime labs and prosecutors can manage in a somewhat timely manner. What about that as those two aspects? I agree with you 100 percent. I've actually introduced two proposals that are being reviewed by the committee uh, right now with regards to discovery and speedy trial. Um, Basically, in talking with the uh, villages and the mayor's associations in this state, they are not in a position staffing-wise and structurally, to try to get these uh, reviews done in 15 days. You know, I think that's, that is, it, it's critically, critically important that this information is developed correctly. We're going to end up with documents that are fast-paced uh, through just to get it done. Uh, you're going to see some cases probably not, not completed because they just don't have the time. Uh, some of the things that you have to have done, for example, if police officers are wearing a camera, you've got to have the video from that. Freeport Police Department, and as, as an example, most of their police staff uh, wear cameras. You've got to get all of those cameras back. You've got to have the films reviewed and, and a report given on each of those. Very difficult to do in 15 days. In fact, uh, we worked with uh, the mayors and, and villages association to put the legislation we're proposing together, uh, the cost of this is also alarming. The fact that that has to be done in 15 days, they're going to have to increase staff, they're have to going to pay a great deal of uh, overtime. One of the estimates I was given is the total cost statewide might be three quarters of a billion dollars. Uh, we need discovery to be done properly. We need to protect certain in- individuals in that process, get a true report of all the circumstances associated with that, and we're not going to be able to do that in 15 days. So in essence, Senator Brooks, you know, I think we're in agreement here that yeah. minor tweaks aren't remotely enough here and that every aspect of this new law needs examination. And uh, what we will have today as far as the full input of the state DAs and the NYPD and other law enforcement agencies, with that being said, and I posed this to Senator Gorin yesterday, why not just put out a full blown moratorium on it until we can figure this out together both sides coming together you know why not just kind of put a halt to this so that we can put some of the old stuff in place until we can figure out and put in these new insertions why not that at least at this point in time sir uh i would tell you that i wouldn't be opposed to that i think it i think now the the thing that took me back yesterday was senator gordon's response he was not in favor of a moratorium, he feels that let's put the vote out there. It will be quicker than trying to decide, you know, what's good, what's not good. My feeling was to him, he didn't agree with it. You know, my feeling was 
that this thing is in such a state of disaster right now uh, that at least put put the uh, the stop sign up. Well, let's discuss at least as far as both sides and Albany come together. He didn't feel that way. I was a little surprised. And we know he's one of the main architects. I know him and Monica Martinez have gotten together as far as, you know, trying to do this thing with the judge's discretion, other things that are needed. At least I think you're open to more of these types of tweaks, uh, major tweaks, as a matter of fact. But he was not in favor as far as a full moratorium is concerned. Well, I, I will tell you that Jim, Monica, and myself have been working. In fact, we met with folks over the weekend. I, I think that, that everybody's entitled to their own opinion in the end. I think if we can make some uh, short gains, if you will, in terms of discretion, that will start to mitigate the situation. Uh, I think some people recognize that prior to this legislation, there were problems where people were being uh, held in, in uh, jail for extended periods of time for relatively minor cases just because they couldn't make bail. Uh, we have the tragic situation in, in uh, Rikers where the individual committed suicide eventually. So I think, I think uh, there, there are many people who honestly want to make sure people are not held in prison where they haven't been convicted. It's a nonviolent situation solely because they can't make what might be a relatively minor bail fee. So I think people will have uh, different opinions. They're entitled to those opinions. I'm concerned with what we've seen here in, in, the, in the first uh, less than a month of, of this law has been in, in effect, where you have repeat offenders going out, where we, again, we have individuals calling where people with mental health problems are being released. You know, Jimmy and I agree on most everything. I, I wouldn't be opposed to... to uh, putting a stay on this until we, we got that together, but we're going to have to put the right people together and move quickly to uh, address it. You know, we're each entitled to our opinions on that. I, I think Jim has absolutely been one of the leading advocates of getting this straight, as Monica has also. I have been working with them on different issues. Uh, I think we're trying to do what's right. How, how you uh, address a, uh, a particular situation like putting a stay, uh, people are going to have different opinions. State Senator John Brooks uh, with us, 8th District, uh, in favor of a moratorium. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's being discussed today as far as uh, the uh, majority leader in Andrew Stewart Cousins uh, with many, uh, many uh, uh, around the table, including both district attorneys, Nassau and Soak, Madeline Singers, Tim Sini, enforcement all over the place as well. And I've said all along, Senator Brooks, you know, the template, the poster child as far as why this thing is not working is the Jordan Randolph case. You know about him. He, this was a guy who was busted on New Year's Day for harassment and tampering with uh, one of those ignition lock devices. And then less than two weeks after he was released, he drove drunk and killed... Uh, this uh, Jonathan Maldonado on the William Floyd, and it was just a horrific story. And, by the way, it was immediately released again. I mean, if that doesn't tell you something's wrong here, and, you know, it eventually turned out that Randolph could have been required to post bail or sit in jail because he was already on probation. But because of the new law's complexities, they were certainly confused of uh, both systems, and that's why you cannot have guys like Jordan Randolph uh, let out on the street only to do his acts of of negativity again and again and again. It's just it, you just can't have it. I listen. I, I've made reference to the movie The Purge because that's what you have. You have a real life purge going on here. That's uh, that's what needs to be fixed. But certainly the Jordan Randolphs of this world are prime examples of why this thing needs to be fixed. You know. Yeah, and and, and clearly I think uh, everybody should have been given instructions as to. The, the latitudes they do have within this law to hold people and not release people and the rest, you know, we, we can't, we can't allow these tragedies to continue. That's for certain. No question. Uh, a couple of minutes uh, remain with the uh, Senator uh, from district uh, number eight. Were you surprised? Now I'm going to be all, uh, all ears and eyes upon the budget address today from the governor's 10th uh, revealing as far as dollars and cents, a uh, couple of things involved there. First off, were you surprised, Senator, that there was no mention in his state of the state regarding this? And the second question I have is for the budget address. 
We know there's a large deficit, 6.1, 6.2 billion. We know that Medicaid, public schools, a lot of questions there. Are you confident regarding the schools will get their fair share before we let you go? And also, uh, any reaction on your end as far as why no remarks regarding cash bail from the governor a couple of weeks ago in his state of the state? No, I, I, I don't have a remark on that. I do want to just address the school funding situation, though, for a minute. I, I think uh, there's a number of issues we have to look at. I believe, particularly given the impact of the new federal tax laws, how it treated salt taxes. New York State paid $15 billion more in taxes because of the exclusions from the, uh, the salt situation. On Long Island in particular, many districts, 70% and more of the cost of education is being funded by residential property taxes, and then those taxes are subject to that uh, $10,000 cap. One of the things I want to see in this budget, or we're going to work on, and we have some legislation pending, is real tax relief on residential property taxes. We're in a situation where we're paying, we have the highest taxes probably in the United States. Many, many people were basically taxed on their taxes this year because they went through the $10,000 cap. Everything above that became subject to taxes again. We're in a situation where we need to get additional funding into into, uh, school districts, but we can't penalize those individuals that are already overfunding because of the excessive dependence on residential property taxes. So that's one of the things I want to see what's happening with the budget uh, um, as we see that later today. No question. And when I bring up the Medicaid stuff, uh, I know that uh, he got a little bit of last-minute help uh, when tax revenues through December came in, a little over $1 billion, I think it was one point three actually, ahead of projections. Right. And I know uh, Governor Cuomo has promised to find some savings in the Medicaid program. And that accounts for, I believe, uh, if my numbers are correct, $4 billion as far as the state deficit. So that, uh, that'll be very interesting the way that shakes out today. Uh, we await, no question. So, yeah, it's uh, going to of- be an interesting budget. It's going to be um, a challenging um, session in terms of putting the budget together. But I think we really have to start looking at how we're funding things. Not just the cost, but how we fund and, and to put such an excessive uh, demand on residential homeowners, I think, has got to change. Uh, yeah. We've long recognized that property taxes are not the best way to fund stuff. You know, you basically pay a tax based on the value of your home, but that doesn't reflect your economic condition. You've got somebody who owns a house free and clear, someone who owns a house that's got an exceptionally high mortgage, We've got seniors that bought a home, say, 50 years ago, maybe for $8,000. Today it might be worth $800,000 per number. That's not reflective of their financial situation either. So we really have to take a hard look at how we're funding things, and I think uh, we have to take into consideration not only the excessive dependence on property taxes on Long Island, the high percentage we're spending in terms of total school funding, and the penalty that comes with the new federal tax law. We've got to look at all of that. We cannot just look at somebody's house and say, oh, that person's rich. They can pay $25,000 in property taxes. It just doesn't work. And I think also I'll be I'll be eagerly awaiting to see how he does it. You know, two, two biggest parts of the state budget – you know, while avoiding, you know, any type of gimmick tree, I don't think you're going to have that involved at all this year. Any fiscal gimmick tree at all, cost shifts, tax increases, certainly a no-no. We await, and we will find out. Listen, always a pleasure to have you. Uh, we hope to have you back uh, soon after you have imposed this moratorium. <laughs> Keep the fingers crossed. But in, in any event, uh, Senator Brooks, we await, and hopefully some good things to come out of Albany here. Okay, Jay, thanks, and uh, you have a great day.